Well, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm Mark Sarangelo, and I run Sierra Nevada Space Systems. Uh, also with me, I have Luciano, oh, Luciano Scannini. <laughs> Uh, Luciano has joined us uh, recently as uh, our uh, representative for international business and we're very pleased here to, to talk to you uh, about Dream Chaser and give you a little bit more insight into what we have planned. Uh, this is uh, set up as, a, uh, as an overview of our new design, our latest design and our expansion of our cargo system. Uh, we're also later on going to take questions and uh, have uh, any interaction with the press. Just as a, a way of background, we'll start with a, a brief video, if we can. It'll give you a sense of what we're, we're planning, and uh, we will come back to the video again later in the, in the presentation. What you're seeing here is a, uh, a video just put together about the Dream Chaser space system that we have been working on for the last nine years. This is an uh, upgraded variant of the Dream Chaser. It's an autonomous vehicle that is now capable of launching both on an Ariane as well as an Atlas, as well as several other launch systems. It contains several new different parts of the vehicle. The first is that it has a folding wing design, which allows it to be encapsulated in a standard five medium fairing. It has a full cargo system uh, attachment as a trailer uh, that is uh, capable of taking both pressurized and unpressurized cargo. Uh, what you see there is two solar arrays that will allow for the vehicle to have supplemental power to provide it with an on-order uh, loiter time significantly longer than any mission that has been brought up to the space station. Uh, it will dock autonomously, and re uh, after it uh, transfers its cargo, it will be able to come back to, to Earth, uh, separate the cargo system, which will burn up and dispose of the unpressurized and pressurized cargo not needed on the space station, and a return home, a highly reusable vehicle. We expect to get several dozen flights per vehicle. Uh, it comes in at a low G re-entry point at 1.6 Gs and lands on a runway, uh, about 2,500 meter runway, any commercial runway, with immediate access to critical payloads, much like you're offloading on a, uh, on a cargo system. The first launch is expected in 2018, and we'll rerun this video at the end. For those of you who don't know, uh, Sierra Nevada has been around for a considerable amount of time. We're now about 3,000 people uh, throughout the world. We do business in 26 countries, uh, a significant number of production space. Uh, corporate growth has been consistent. We've been profitable, and probably most unusually for a big aerospace company, we're privately owned and uh, are fortunate enough not to have any outside debt or any outside shareholders. So we're able to look to the long term and do missions that perhaps other companies aren't capable of doing. We've received numerous amounts of awards recently. Uh, probably my favorite is one of the best places to work. And I think that the longevity of our employees is one of the things that really has made a difference for us. In our space group, we are now in our 26th year of, of uh, flying. And we've uh, now are at uh, 425 missions. Uh, about 4,000 things that we've produced has gone on to orbit and virtually every major program that has been out there. And this, this year, we're launching something every three weeks or so. Uh, currently, we have about 70 active space programs, and recently were awarded as one of the world's top 10 most innovative companies in space. Uh, four things that we do in space. We are a, a, a satellite maker, a small satellite maker. This year, we'll be launching 11 satellites uh, during the course of the year. We are one of the biggest producers of subsystems and components. A uh, rocket motor provider, not a launch system company, but a motor provider. And uh, as you will see here in detail, the owner and operator of the orbital space system known as Dream Chaser. What, what I'd like to introduce to this audience for really the first time in Europe is our variant that is dedicated to cargo. And you saw the brief video. Many of you know that NASA has been producing, uh, has produced a cargo uh, RFP, a request for proposal. That is a very significant effort. It's actually more significant than the crew effort that they, they uh, uh, awarded last year. This is uh, an effort expected to be awarded this summer and multiple awards, four to five cargo missions a year. Uh, each wintering company will produce, uh, will get a minimum of six missions. And the current contract value for this award is $14 billion US. It's a six year period from 2018 to 2024 meant to bring critical cargo up and down to the space station. There's five different types of missions that are being contemplated by, by NASA. 
two for up, to, up mass delivery, pressurized up mass and unpressurized up mass, and three for return. Return accelerated, return for disposal, and return uh, unpressurized for, for burn up. Our system, which is a derivative of the Dream Chaser design, uh, has been, as I mentioned, modified in several interesting ways. We uh, have now fitted it inside a standard five millimeter fairing built by RUAG, both for Aran Spas as well as for United Launch Alliance. And we've attached to it a cargo module that is capable of taking internal and external unpressurized cargo. The vehicle itself is fully autonomous. And the mission profile, as we, uh, as we contemplate, is a launch out of Kourou or a launch out of Florida. Uh, se fairing separation, the ability then to deploy solar arrays on orbit, which gives us a significant lo loiter time. We autonomously dock, this is an uncrewed vehicle, autonomously dock to the space station, offload in internal cargo, uh, offload our external cargo, which is done through standard FRAMs, as NASA calls it. Uh, and then once the station uh, cargo is unloaded, we will take back on board both cargo to return to, or, to Earth as well as cargo that will be burnt up. The uh, cargo that will be disposed will be in the, in the uh, carrier system on the rear of the aircraft, and then the remaining cargo will come home to a runway landing. Uh, this is a, a sort of a blow up of that. We are contemplating about 5,500 kilograms of pressurized and unpressurized up mass, which is a significant amount of, uh, of cargo weight. Uh, and we're doing that in the two different systems, subsystems, as you see here. But what I think is most unusual and perhaps unique in this particular uh, genre of vehicles is that we're able to not only take up everything that's necessary, pressurized and pressurized, but bring home and bring home to a, a runway landing a significant amount of the science that's going on on board. And uh, that is, is something that is in, uh, certainly in tremendous need for NASA. Uh, this is a, a brief chart that just shows on the left side NASA's needs for the, ver the various categories of cargo. Uh, and this is a, basically a one-year mission need. As many of you know, there are currently four providers, uh, four providers on the U.S. side for cargo and the Russian providers with, uh, with progress in the f of the four providers, Europe and Japan are, are currently not contemplated to extend into this period in 2018. So there is a significant need to bring up and bring home cargo. NASA has outlined seven different criteria, primary criteria, and our system exceeds uh, by uh, significant margins virtually every one of those criteria. And we're very proud to be able to do that within one system that is highly reusable. Uh, I'm also, uh, we are, we're very uh, excited to be expanding our launch options, and I, uh, in addition to the Atlas V, which has been the primary launch system for our crewed version of the vehicle, which we're still continuing, we have now uh, entered into an agreement with Ariane Spas, and I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Thomas Hunt, if he's in the audience, uh, Thomas. Uh, Thomas is the uh, Senior Vice President and CFO of Ariane Spas, and we have uh, added this launch system, which is, a, as many of you know, a terrific launch system onto our repertoire. The vehicle can launch on either, and because the fairing is identical, virtually identical between the two vehicles, and the vehicles within a fairing basically would see Dream Chaser as a very large satellite, it becomes a very elegant way to be able to expand options and, and provide a global system. We can also look at other launch vehicles, and we are, and that includes the U.S. Delta, Japanese, uh, H-2B and H-3 when that's produced. And e any, either of those vehicles could also provide the lift. But uh, currently in our uh, plans and our proposal, we have both of these launch vehicles as options. Uh, I think part of the benefit of having this type of runway system and runway vehicle is, is the ability to come back. Uh, we, we turn home at less than 1.6 Gs, about 1.55 .5, Gs, which is the, the G-force of a very good roller coaster. It's very, very benign, very calm. We come home to a runway landing, a runway landing of about 2,500 meters. Any commercial runway virtually in the world that could take a seven, Boeing 737 or an Airbus 320 or 330 can take this vehicle. Because we actually have engineered it with no toxic materials on board, unlike the previous versions of the space shuttle, uh, we can actually land in any commercial runway. And by doing that, we also have immediate access. Uh, there's no standoff waiting for the safing to, to happen uh, for poisonous or, or uh, hazardous materials. And that allows us to go right on board and take off any of the critical science. 
Uh, we're home from the space station within 8 to 12 hours, and the vehicle can return home not only to a U.S. runway, but really a runway anywhere in the world. What's particularly interesting is that the return back to the launch site is a very simple matter. The wings fold and it returns inside a cargo plane like a Boeing um, a C-17. We have uh, been working this program as uh, this is my third year speaking here, and some of you have, have uh, taken this journey with us. We've been working this program now for about 10 years. Uh, it's well over $500 million U.S. invested into the program. Uh, we've completed 1,500 wind tunnel tests. We have verified virtually all the systems. We have produced a full-scale version of the vehicle, which has started its flight test program and will be expanding its flight test opportunities uh, later this year for the second phase of that program. Uh, we've gone through very significant work on thermal protection and, and our engines have been qualified for this particular vehicle. And we've also started the build uh, with our partner Lockheed Martin of the first orbital vehicle, which is now, uh, the cabin is now complete for that vehicle. Beyond the uh, cargo missions, we, one of the reasons that we've gone into this and put the time and money and investment that we did is we feel that this is a very useful low earth orbit vehicle for many other purposes. Uh, it has the ability to do short and long duration science missions. It can, uh, it can work on uh, construction of, of new systems in space or repair of the space station or other systems. It, allow, it has the ability to deploy or retrieve or move satellites out of orbit. And it can act as a test bed for science for Earth observation, all from the same basic uh, space frame. As uh, many of you know, and it's one of my favorite pictures, is, is the ability to make a team. And those of you who've heard me speak, I speak very highly of creating a team. And our team right now uh, now numbers well over 20 different countries that have had some involvement with this program and uh, 30 or 32 different industrial corporations and 10 universities. And while that's a very large group of organizations, we feel we're better off by reaching out to the world and having that type of involvement in the program. And, and in my view, in our view, the success is really something that is a team dream, not, not a, a singular dream. Earlier this week, uh, we and NASA announced ex an extension of our current agreements uh, for, uh, for development of the vehicle. And uh, that, we have to say thank you to our NASA partners for that. Uh, we currently are working with uh, eight different NASA centers, and we have uh, continued to, to work with NASA to develop the concept of this vehicle. And we're very thankful for the support and the partnership and the friendship that NASA has provided us in the course of doing this. Uh, we have uh, already engaged quite uh, significantly here in Europe uh, with the European Space Agencies and industry partners. Uh, yeah, ESA and DOR, I, I believe there's representatives from OHB in the room, uh, RUAG, Airbus, uh, Space Applications, Kinetic, GMV, Talos Alenia Space, Ariane Spas, and we're continuing to expand our relationship base with, uh, within Europe. It is something that's important to, to me and to us as an organization, and, and we're being very fortunate to get the best of the best, not only in the United States, but throughout the world on this program. Uh, ESA, uh, we have agreements now directly with ESA, with uh, the DLR, and as well as with JAXA, the J Japanese Space Agency, samples of what we might be doing, or we are looking at working with ESA about how we might adopt the uh, IBDM, the International Berthing and Docking Mechanism, to this vehicle and provide, in, in partnership and cooperation, design manufacturing here in Europe and get flight opportunities for this particular system on Dream Chaser. And our role with ESA has actually expanded in many different ways. We have a memorandum of, of agreement that really is quite expansive to be able to look at how we can intergra interact between ESA and many of the countries and companies here in Europe. Uh, we have a, a partnership agreement on CRS2 that will allow ESA to be a participant in that program in the future. And as I mentioned, the different types of technologies that we're looking at, it's, it's uh, very fortunate for, for me and us to be able to do that. And I'd like to particularly recognize uh, Marco Capucci, if he's in the room. Uh, Marco is uh, somewhere back, there he is, has been a, a terrific uh, leader for us in, in working with ESA and has really helped us understand what's the best way to do that. So thank you, Marco, for, for all your great work. Uh, one of the uh, aspects of why we're doing this is that beyond the cargo missions, this particular vehicle can also act as a uh, in-orbit laboratory. Basically, the inside of the vehicle has a, about the same amount of volume and space as one of the modules on the space station, with the exception that it has the ability to return home. 
So you can imagine a year's worth of research going on with specialized experiments instead of uh, being uh, captured by the experiments that the stations that are on the space station, this particular vehicle, in addition to what goes on on the ISS, could bring those experiments home, bring them back to a runway, change out these experiment stations, and then relaunch. And we could do that many, many times with the same vehicle. What you see here is one quarter of one side of the vehicle, and you see various experimental stations to give you a sense of size and perspective. So in, uh, in our world, we, we feel we're ready to take the next step with this vehicle. We now have both a crew variant and an autonomous uh, primary cargo, but also autonomous science variant. Uh, we are working together with our partners to position that well for, for what NASA is looking to do. Uh, we have retired the majority of the risks of the vehicle over the last 10 years, and we've now begun the actual production phase of orbital vehicles, which is a big step forward. We're closing in and completing CDR in the vehicle. Um, and I think also as importantly for those of you, and particularly here in Europe, I've been coming here for many years, and uh, as I started this effort now 10 years ago on this type of vehicle, one of the first places I looked was all the great research that was done in Europe on lifting bodies and winged vehicles, which is, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of money and effort spent here by many, not only industrial partners, but also by the agencies. We've taken that, we've combined it with the 40 years of existing history from the space shuttle program, and we feel that by putting those two together, we've gotten tremendously smarter and, and better, and we are very proud to be able to carry that heritage forward into flight. And um, as you see here, we, we really respect the past as, uh, as a key to the future. Uh, this is my picture of a little brother and big brother, in case anyone wants to see, and uh, it, is, it is fun. We do enjoy ourselves. What is interesting about this picture, it is to scale. And our view was the space shuttle was very much like a very, a very big moving lorry or truck. Uh, it is meant to big, hu bring huge pieces to, to orbit. Uh, we're more like that, that vehicle that you might want to take around town every day with the uh, capability of taking seven people and critical cargo up and down. What is interesting, though, is that the ha habitable space, the pressurized space in the two vehicles is very comparable, even though the size is not. And, uh, and we, we feel very positive about that. What you see here is uh, one of my favorite pictures. It is an in-flight picture of the last flight of the Enterprise shuttle in its testing and our first flight in our testing. Uh, we took, the testing took place at the same place, the same range on the same day uh, many years later. And you can see the two, two uh, pictures together. And I will say after 35 years, we've had better cameras now than we did before. <laughs> Uh, and uh, that's, that's quite good. And, you know, part of what we do and part of why I, I love doing what I do is that this is something that's been a passion for me since I was a boy. And I come from a family of people who've been involved with aerospace for many years. And there is a passion here about remembering why we all did this. And I think that is to keep that dream alive, to keep, keep the, the child in us uh, looking forward and being excited about what we do there. And so we think it is something important that it's never too late to dream and we really do appreciate uh, all of you listening and I'll show our video one more time that, now that you've seen the, the presentation so you can take a look at it again and then I'll open up for questions. So as we finish this video, I, uh, I want to express my appreciation on behalf of all my team and partners for the opportunity to talk to you. We continue to expand our, our uh, field here in, in Europe. Uh, we just finished working together with the Italian Air Force on an agreement that will 
allow us to study hypersonics together. Uh, hypersonics is a big part of this vehicle. Some of you know about the, the speed of the vehicle, but it, it, it travels at Mach 25 while in orbit. And uh, it is, uh, goes from Mach 25 down to a landing speed of about 230 kilometers, so a very short period of time. So we learned quite a lot about all the different regimes in space. So as we finish now, thank you for listening, and I'll take, uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them for whatever time we have. Well, thank you, Mark Lacey-Rangelo, uh, Corporate Vice President of uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation Space Systems. We have uh, approximately half an hour for a Q&A. Are there any questions before we hit the IF cocktail? Hello, thanks, Mark. How are you? It's uh, amazing what you are doing. I, I, want, I want you to ask from the point of view of a potential customer. So, uh, how fast can you reconfigure the, to put payload inside, and uh, yeah, what would be the turnover, and how complex is it to to design payloads to use it? Yeah, very good. We there are a couple of answers to that. We expect about a 30-day turnaround on the vehicle, so uh, it's a very fast turnaround to be able to launch again. The inside, uh, reconfiguring for the inside, what we're doing is designing to standard uh, specifications so that we will publish those specifications for anyone who wants to do uh, laboratory uh, inserts or modules. But we're using the same standard cargo containers that ESA currently uses and NASA currently uses, so there should be no real difficulty in, in being able to reconfigure. The vehicle is expected to be able to fly four to five times a year. Do you have a target cost per kilogram that we would uh, upload there? Uh, we do, but we're not releasing it right now because we're, we're still in the middle of a competition, as you may know. So see me in a couple months, and I'll answer that. Other questions? Oh. Okay. Well, we're standing between the room and cocktail hour, but... Thank you. Uh, how many systems do you plan to build uh, simultaneously? How many do you want to buy? Oh. <laughs> okay, one is oh, yeah. good, thank you. Uh, no, it's a very good question. We, this vehicle is built out of composites. Uh, it's about 90% composites. It's really the most advanced use of composites anywhere in the world. Uh, Lockheed, who's helping us build the structure, it's their Skunk Works division, which does advanced composites. And they're learning from us on how to do this. But the important thing about composites is that most of the cost is in the mold to do, to do the work. So subsequent vehicles are a lot less expensive to produce. And we will produce what, what is necessary for the type of workload that we have. But we currently in, imagine a, f a, f an, a beginning fleet of three to five vehicles. And then we'll see what happens from there. Because there is a lot of longevity with each vehicle, if we have a dedicated science vehicle and a dedicated cargo vehicle and a dedicated crew vehicle, then we'll determine what variants we want to do. But it's very much like an airline uh, as an Airbus or a Boeing plane, which can be can reconfigured for cargo or crew or for uh, military purposes or firefighting purposes. We have the same thought process here in that about 70% of the vehicle is similar, and then the final 20 or 30% is going to be based on whatever the variant is. Other questions? Vincenzo Giorgio, Talesta Linea Space. Uh, you've been talking about the cargo carrier capability, okay. and okay, we're fine with that. Are you planning to have something for release of satellite, either micro, mini satellite? Is that in your roadmap for the use of the vehicles? And if so, what's the mean of releasing satellite you're, talk you're thinking to? Yeah, there, thank you. There are two, there are two dire directions for that. One is that the servicing vehicle, which I didn't show today, is actually going to be configured with robotic capabilities. So it could actually grab a satellite, and we think that many satellites that are dead are in the wrong orbit. To reduce debris in the future, there may be a reason to do that. This vehicle can fly different altitudes and plane changes, so it can do multiple 
missions on the same time. And that's the servicing side. The other side of it is that there is the capability of doing a cargo bay door in the vehicle. It is not shown in this because this is a cargo vehicle, but the vehicle underneath in its design is what we call scarred or, or lay, uh, laid out to uh, adopt for a cargo bay door that would allow us to deploy from the inside of the vehicle uh, a series of satellites. And you know, it is not the, obviously not the size of the space shuttle, but it is capable of doing that. Interesting, it can do both at the same time. So we could deliver satellites and potentially remove or, or push into a decaying orbit satellites that are in, in trouble. And all from the same design, and that's why we as a company have chosen to invest in this design, because you can do multiple missions from the same basic platform, where many of the other designs are fairly limited to one or two different missions. Thank you, it's a great question. Exploration lady, uh, uh, would the vehicle be able to serve for a, a mission with people uh, in uh, Leo, in uh, moon vicinity, which is lunar? Yeah, we're not designing for a, a lunar. No. This is a low Earth orbit, probably up to 1,200 kilometers in that range, perhaps a little higher. Enough to go fix the Hubble telescope, for example. That okay. would be the type but of mission we could do. But say not with radiation protection, yeah, good so enough uh, for... We, we're not looking to go to the moon okay. with this. And, and that's, we're very focused in on being able to do many things in low Earth orbit. And we think that uh, other, uh, frankly, capsules and other programs are better to go to the moon and beyond. Okay. However, if we're going to ever go beyond Earth and we want to construct something in low Earth orbit, which is one of the the more popular ways of thinking about building, uh, we would be able to do that. We also would be able to fix the space station, for example, and uh, we can do EVAs out of this building. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we can, we can ex uh, exit the vehicle or do EVAs from this, which is uh, very useful as yeah, well. That's interesting. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Sarangelo, very yes. pragmatic question. Uh, is the design of Dream Chasers is already finalized or uh, we have a chance, let's say, you're still open for cooperation in some modules and some parts? Yes, I, as a good pilot and a good aviation designer, I will say my vehicle's never finished. <laughs> uh, that's the correct answer, but I, I understand your point. Uh, the answer is no, it's not. We, we have finished the outer mold line, we've finished the primary systems for the initial vehicle, but we expect to be able to upgrade the vehicle. And, and the whole thought of the process is that we had to do, we need to do something to get the vehicle into test mode and then begin testing it. But we expect and, and welcome actually the ability to continue to upgrade the different subsystems of, of the vehicle, uh, either by adding something on such as robotics, as I was just talking about, or by looking at a subsystem which exists in the vehicle that perhaps could be upgraded. It's very modular in its design and intended that way. Yes. We have time for other two questions. Yeah. May you please say something about the flexibility you may have for the landing site selection? Flexibility for landing sites? Selection, yes. yes. Um, it is one of the more exciting parts of the vehicle. We, we are capable of landing virtually on any 2,500 meter runway. Uh, it is, there, as I mentioned, no toxic materials. So that, that allows us to approach a commercial runway. Uh, the vehicle has, it's basically the size of a large regional jet in terms of its size and scope. So it's, people think the space shuttle, it's, it's not that. Uh, quite at all. It's, it's uh, 20 meters by 15 meters in that, in that size vicinity. So we ha it's capable of going to most places. Um, whether or not we go there is a factor of, of the different countries, but we have intentionally, and I have a team of people looking at potential landing sites around the world. One of the reasons for that is that we believe that this is a vehicle that could serve as a, um, a country space program. For those countries who are interested in having a space program, we could package the vehicle, the training, the rocket, and be able to, for one price, be able to do that with the very ex exciting possibility of returning home to the host country, which has never been able to be done before. So we are looking at landing sites throughout Europe, throughout the world, 
uh, is not difficult for us to contemplate because we, it's very easy for us to come home, as I mentioned, in that uh, the vehicle loads inside a cargo vehicle, which we've identified a cargo plane, standard cargo plane, and can fly home. So it's, uh, it's a, we think a really good thing. And why, why we did that, besides just the vehicle, I want to say one more moment, is because as a passionate person in space, I think that it's important to bring space to the people. Uh, so many, so few people, some of maybe this room, many people have seen launch or seen a landing, but that doesn't happen very often. And the idea of being able to land in places that perhaps there's a country that has a lot of experiments and we can bring the experiments home and the school children of that country could be able to see the space program firsthand, which is something that we really can't see right now. And part of our job and my job, I think, is to inspire the next generation. And the easiest way to do that, the way that many of us got inspired, was to see something in person. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Hi. I was wondering if you have performed any other drop tests in, um, since 2013. Uh, we have not performed any other drop tests at that altitude. We've done a series of other tests, ground tests and uh, systems tests, we have scheduled now an, an upgrade series of flights starting later this year for the next round. What's most important for us now is that we, what we're going to be doing is testing the orbital systems. The first set of vehicles which the tests went, uh, it had a, a gear problem on landing, but the actual flight of the test, we passed all 40 of the NASA test markers in the very first flight. So we had anticipated two or three flights. We actually got everything we needed in one flight. So what we're doing now is we're, we're upgrading the systems of the vehicle, and later this year we'll be taking it up and, and actually debuting the orbital systems on the, on the atmospheric vehicles and make sure that they work. Okay. And so you were talking about the uh, first launch in uh, 2018. Yes. So what will be the major steps um, before you reach this date? Uh, first, probably the biggest step is the software on the vehicle because it is an autonomous vehicle, so we need to... As you can imagine, it's quite a, a significant software activity that needs to go on. Uh, the first flight of the vehicle that you referenced was autonomous. It was not ground controlled. It was not piloted. So we have a pretty good understanding of how to do that. But we need to be able to ensure that all the software and all the, the variations of that software work. The vehicle itself is, is uh, probably further along than, than most people realize. It's it, aerodynamically. It's been through a lot of tests. All the subsystems that we're using have been tested. Uh, so I think most of the, the biggest aspect is, is integration with the launch vehicle, uh, now Ariane as well as Atlas, and being able to deal with the software questions for the many missions that we might do. Thank you for the question. <laughs>